So I think here you most of you are here because you are somehow interested in, in reproducibility. I think the UK RNA network is trying to promote reproducibility in various aspects in the United Kingdom. And then and uh, and thanks for hosting us this time to, to discuss about reproducibility in systems biology modeling. So in this uh, session or in this workshop, we will first discuss about the, the talk about the work we have done on improving reproducibility of systems biology modeling and then uh, we, we we discuss about the solution we, we provided a scorecard we came with a scorecard that can be used to solve the reproducibility issue in this field and uh, we'll have a session where uh, we'll show how to use this uh, scorecard probably some of you can use the scorecard and score the models and actually check indeed if these this works or not uh, in uh, finding out quickly whether a model is reproducible. Okay, uh, to introduce myself, uh, I'm uh, Rahman Sharif. I'm a project leader for biomodels at the uh, EMBL, uh, EBI, EMBLS European Molecular Biology Laboratory. And we have several uh, uh, stations across Europe. The one in Cambridge is called European Bioinformatics Institute. And that's where we, I'm based. With me here uh, today is Henning Hem Jakob, who's also uh, from the EMBL EBI, who heads uh, the molecular networks cluster uh, and biomodels is part of that cluster. Okay, so in this talk, uh, the first session, we'll number one talk about biomodels repository itself, and then the reversibility study that was carried out in this biomodels repository. So, biomodels repository is basically focused on mathematical models. So, for those who know, what mathematical modeling is, uh, it is a way of representing a biological system using mathematical equations so that you can understand the system better. Physicists have been using these concepts for a long time. They define a biophysical process using sort of defined equation and use to study the system and learn more about the system and then do experiment to validate those uh, predictions. So biologists have been doing this. We have wet lab experiments. From the wet lab experiments, we can define mathematical equations representing the biology and use that to infer the functional mechanism of how the biological system function. And then we can do further experiment and validate these, uh, these models or assumptions. And this is a trading process. Of course, uh, we keep on improving our model and understanding of the biological system. Once you build a model, of course, uh, you can build, build your model based on the a priori knowledge experimental data, but you can also build a model from the existing, uh, pre-existing models in the public domain. So to to, to provide pre a platform to share pre pre existing models or previously built models, Biomodels was established uh, about 16 years ago as a platform to exchange mathematical models of vertical system. So, Biomodels, what is Biomodels again? It's a database of a uh, repository of mathematical models of biological and biomedical system. Uh, it hosts a vast range of bio biomedical models. You can follow the link below. Uh, www.ebay.ac.uk slash biomodels to access biomodels. You land on this page and you can browse the model, download and extract these models. Uh, and these models are well characterized and you, you'll be able to use these models immediately. As a modeler, uh, anyone can come and submit their model to biomodels. They can submit models in various modeling approaches. It can be an ordinary differential equation model or a logic, logic model or a petri net based model or constraint based model, such as genome scale metabolic models. And all these models can be in any format. They can be in a standard format, such as SBML, uh, cell ML, farm ML, or they can be a MATLAB script or Python script. Uh, they can all be hosted or submitted to biomodels database. So we had been expanding the support to various uh, uh, programming languages so that all different models can be hosted and shared with the rest of the modeling community. So, so as a modeler, you build your model, you submit your model to Biomodels database, you get a unique accession number for your model, and then you, you provide access to this model to your manuscript reviewer. So you submit your model uh, along with your, uh, uh, with your metadata to Biomodels, but then when you have your publication submitted to a journal, uh, you also get an ac unique access to the reviewers of uh, of your uh, of your uh, of your article to access this model. So, model essentially, the model will remain private. No one would be able to access until 
your MAP publications out. So it will be safe, secured, only with secured access to the reviewer. Once your manuscript is reviewed, accepted, and published, then the model associated will also be publicly published in Biomorph database. So they will we'll try to do it as soon as possible so that uh, users can directly access your model from your publication. So we recommend that you include a model identifier in your publication or link to the model in the publication so that it becomes live when the manuscript is out. Okay, so this is the, the usual process, the way we work. One of the additional service we provide is the model curation. So we, we don't just host models, we also curate models. So what is curation? A curation is a process where we make sure that the model is doing what it's supposed to do. For example, in this case, we look into the model more carefully. We look into the equations pro, uh, provided in the manuscript carefully. Uh, we encode them in a computer readable format such as SBML, which is systems biology markup language. And we run simulation using simulation tools such as Copasi and try to reproduce the simulation results. So for us, a model is curated only if uh, we manage to reproduce at least one of the simulation results uh, in the uh, reference manuscript. Once we manage to reproduce the result, we call this model as curated and we add extra layer of semantics, uh, gene ontology, so that these models are uh, searchable, findable, and they also uh, the user will be able to unambiguously identify by this component of the model. So in the past, we have focused on different topics and tried to collect models into biomodels. Of course, these are models uh, uh, submitted by the curators, and we have a huge collection of diabetes model uh, in biomodels database. We also have a huge collection of uh, neurodegenerative models in biomodels database, and and recently we had focused on collecting COVID-19 models. These are the, the SIR models, which we managed to collect, curate, uh, and put them into biomodels. So these models where we reproduce the results, made sure that simulation results are reproduced, and then we added these models to biomodels database. So as a, as a modeler, you can come to biomodels, search for a model term, download any of, the, only, any of these models and reuse them immediately because we have validated these models. So you need to find the models from the curated branch, and these are the models that uh, we have tested and guaranteed that this is, a, this is doing what it's supposed to do. So as an example here, you can come to bar models. If you're in, a model uh, interested in immune response, you can search for immune response and then you will find all the models, uh, let to your keyword, and you can filter the search based on the fastest on the left-hand side and choose different modeling approaches or different keywords or organisms. So if you're interested in a human model, then you can go and select homo, homo sapiens, or if you're interested in mouse model, you can choose mass musculus. So you can filter your, your search further and further based on the facets on the left-hand side and narrow down your search to find the right model you are interested in. And of course, by selecting curated models, you'll be able to find all the models that are curated and are uh, uh, reproducible. So those models are, uh, reproducing simulation results. So you can click on any of these models, go into the model display page, you'll be able to get various information about these models. You can uh, get a quick metadata, what this model is about, uh, the model organism, the model pathways, and all these information uh, from the biomodels database. So if you want to download the models, you need to click on the files tab here. As you can see, this will allow you to choose the right files. If you, you can download the SBML file, we, we do curation of the models and SBML is the SBML as I mentioned, a systems biology markup language, which is sort of the community standards used in code model. One of the reasons behind using is that uh, this model in SBML format can be converted into various other formats. You can convert them, there are converters to, to, to convert an SBML model into uh, 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 MATLAB code. Uh, SBM model can be imported into Python. There are packages to support that. It can be imported into R, uh, Julia, and so on and so forth. So there are several tools. Even a Cytoscape will allow you, there, there are packages in Cytoscape to import and visualize SBM models. So there are several tools which supports uh, uh, SBM model, which makes it really uh, uh, interoperable across various modeling platforms. So you can download this BML model and also additional files which we provide with these models and import them into the, your favorite tool and under simulations. You want to go back, look at the history. Of course, we also provide a history tab where we provide version control 
uh, versions of, I mean, uh, various uh, versions of these these models. So you can go back in history and find the right version, download them, and uh, analyze them if you like. So what does biomodels do? Is biomodels at the end provides uh, fair models. These models are findable. They, they can be searched. Uh, you can search them through EBI search or the, the search engine within the uh, omics DI or the Google dataset search. You can access these models. These models are provided under CC0 license, which means they are very uh, permissible. You can reuse this model either for industrial, industrial use or academic use. Uh, it would be nice if you acknowledge them, but uh, you don't have to. We are very open uh, in that sense. Not just the model, even the biomodels platform itself is open source. Uh, so the, the core base of the, the platform is, is, uh, is also with a CC zero license. Okay, the models here, as I mentioned earlier, are highly interoperable. We focus on SBML, which is one of the, the most actively used uh, standard format within the systems biology modeling community. And of course, the models are highly reusable because uh, the curation provides added value. And we have tested these models, validated them against the associated publication. So you can reuse these models uh, directly uh, in, your, uh, in, your, uh, in your study. My model is widely used uh, for model discovery. Uh, modelers all often look for uh, data, I mean, or models in either PubMed, Google Scholar, and then they look into biomodel database after these two major resources, uh, searching that, of course, uh, this is one of the major uh, data resource for modeling community. And, uh, and a, a lot of model, modelers also uh, disseminate their models through biomodels database uh, after, of course, uh, supplementary material, GitHub, and personal websites. Uh, which are also commonly being used these days, um, which you're trying to, to change and trying to promote uh, some sort of model to a common repository where they are easily findable instead of scattering them across various other resources. So content-wise, biomodels host a huge variety of models from covering various processes, biological processes, from cellular component, multicellular organization, metabolic processes, uh, development, signaling, and so on. And uh, two, and we cover a wide range of diseases, diseases uh, as well, models for Alzheimer's, diabetes, Parkinson's, cancer, they're all uh, making up a good proportion of models uh, in biomodels database. As we curate models, we also add these terms, terminologies, ontologies, which makes us, uh, makes it easier for us to, to get these information, also make these models searchable and findable to the users. So where these models come from, though, there are, uh, these models come from over 300 different journals uh, in Biomodels database, and uh, major journals that host, uh, I mean that uh, models, uh, major uh, three major journals where most of the models come from are PLOS Computational Biology, Molecular Systems Biology, and BM Systems Biology, as you can see here on the top right. They contribute about 27% of the models in Biomodels. And as, as you see star here, these are the models that, um, journals that recommend the users to submit their model to biomodels database. Uh, so this was uh, uh, information that was gathered quite some time ago, but needs to be updated probably. There are more journals recommending biomodels right now. Okay, so we have a huge collection of models and we have over a thousand curated models in biomodels database and over a thousand non-curated uh, non -curated models. And we also have a huge collection of archived models our uh, uh, which we call as uh, path through models. That are, these are auto-generated uh, models, which we have, which we group them together uh, so that they can be easily uh, uh, downloaded. And and we also have a big collection of uh, uh, patient derived genome scale metabolic models. These are models for individual patients, uh, six thousand seven hundred fifty individual patients with cancer. Uh, these are custom. These models are customized based on their genomic state. All these models are available in biomodels, free to download and free to use. So now that we have all the models in one place in standard format such as SBML, it's easy to e extract these SBML models and extract the model parameter values. So model parameters values are very important for the modelers because often they need to find the right values for the parameter searching through the literature, which is not, 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 not an easy task. So because we have our models in a machine readable SBML format, we can extract these information such as the number, the name of the species or the, the model entities, 
uh, the reactions, the parameter values, the rate equations, organisms, and initial concentrations, and so on. So we can extract all these information from these BML models, provide them to the biomodels parameters uh, uh, web interface, uh, and also through the API, so the users can directly interact with these resources, download the information, and use these models. You can search for a keyword of your interest, for example, Caspase 9, you will, uh, you will be provided with all the equations used to model Caspase 9, the model parameters that are being used, and a bunch of link to the external resources, the initial consideration that's being used in, as well. We have a huge kind of uh, uh, parameter values extracted from various uh, resources, I mean, models in the biomodels database and all the details. You can use this to, to enhance your modeling. For example, uh, I'm, I'm showing you a few use cases. You can, uh, for example, get an uh, initial concentration of a protein of your interest, your modeling from various studies and use that to scan your model. And of course, you can also get the parameter value and scan it across uh, uh, your model. For example, here we get the KM values used and you can see there's a huge range of KM values used by different studies uh, across uh, different modeling studies. Biomodels parameters can also provide you reaction rates and equations as I mentioned. You can take a part of the model from one model and then integrate them with other model to, to build a new model and uh, you can uh, do novel simulations. For example, here we combined TNF, uh, NF kappa B, uh, A20 model with ROS, uh, NF kappa B, SOD model so that you have a new model that where you can look at the effect of uh, ROS on uh, inhibitor kappa B or A20. So biomodels parameters can be quite useful resource for modelers who wanted to extract quickly the modeling uh, model parameter values and use them. These are the two main publications which, which will provide you a bit further details on these uh, the resources which I discussed today. Okay, so coming to the main topic, uh, given the background, uh, uh, we now want to move on to the reproducibility system biology modeling. And this is the main work which we will want you to focus today. Uh, before we go into this topic, two, two terminologies that needs to be clarified here. Number one is uh, replicability or repeatability. Number two is reproducibility. So these terms are sometimes confused. So we have to make sure that we are on the same page. So replicability is the ability to use the same code provided with the manuscript in the, with the same software to reproduce the simulation results. When it comes to reproducibility, it's the ability to recreate a model without the original code. So we should be able to build the model from the scratch and run it in the, so in the software different from the one used by the modeler and reproduce the simulation results. That's what we call as uh, reproducibility. So in this study, we focus on reproducibility, not on the replicability. So we assessed about 455 models from uh, peer reviewed publications and try to assess whether the models are uh, reproducible. So the way we did is number one, we encode model equations in SBML because this, this is done as a part of the curation process in biomodel. So uh, we encode them in SBML. Uh, we get parameter values from the manuscript or supplementary material. Uh, we sometimes get the models from the author submission. We run this, we, once we get, get the model ready, we run it in Copasi. That's the tool we use. If the model originally was uh, built using Copasi, then we use different tools. We, can, we will use MATLAB in biology toolbox or LibSBML or Mathematica to run simulation. And we will consider a model as reproducible if at least one of the simulation results uh, from the publication is, could be reproduced. Any minor deviation is still acceptable. We don't mind if there are small changes. Uh, however, if that, it shouldn't affect the main conclusion, the scientific conclusion of the study. If a model cannot be reproduced, we try to fix uh, um, uh, error or fix an errorless equation, erroneous equation in, in, the, in the model and play around, basically play around with the model, tweak the model, and uh, try to empirically uh, fix the model. If you cannot fix the model, I mean, this, this, this means we, let's say we fix a model uh, in which we have plus instead of minus uh, based, based on our understanding of how things should work, or sometimes that could be 0 0.0, could be 0 0.01 instead of 0 0.1 uh, in the model parameter. We can fix those things and similarly, uh, we will be able to fix minor errors here and there uh, by just checking around, playing around with the model because uh, the curators have an ex enough expertise in doing this in the past, so they, we can do that. 
And if you cannot fix the model, we contact the author, uh, uh, corresponding author, ask them to provide more information so that we can reproduce the, the model and the simulation as well. For example, if you want to reproduce this model, uh, we, we read the manuscript, we encode the model uh, in biomodels, uh, in, in SBML, run the simulation, reproduce the results, and submit the model to biomodel database. And let's say, let's say this is a simulation we need to reproduce. What we also do is we provide the simulation results in the curation tab of the biomodels uh, model view overview page. So if I go to this model, model, I can go to the curation tab and I will be able to see the results that we reproduced and that matches the simulation in the manuscript. So in the curator's comment, we provide information that uh, we reproduce figure five in the original publication. And we say the, the, the figure correspond to the K of value of 1.0. We try to provide as much as information possible here about the software being used so that you are transparent. We make sure that uh, uh, the user gets the most information, how we manage to reproduce this figure in the manuscript using the model we, we, we share here. All right, so we have our model uh, cu uh, curated, of course, reproduced. Once it's reproduced, uh, then we record this properly. So how did we do the study? The study, as I mentioned earlier, we curated 455 kinetic models. Uh, kinetic models are ordinary differential equation models. We focus specifically on that so that uh, we don't get uh, deviated and they are simpler form of models compared to other modeling approaches, uh, kinetic modeling approaches, including stochastic models, which are uh, things are changing or delayed differential equ equations, which are a bit more complex. So we kept things simple. We chose 455 kinetic, basically OD, ODE models. These models are from the peer-reviewed research articles published in 152 different journals. Uh, they were taken from 1980s to 2020. And this was done as a part of normal curation by models. Of course, it's not a normal, it's not a randomized sample, but uh, the models are chose, chosen based on the curation priorities uh, in biomodels, which involves funding decisions or uh, uh, curators uh, uh, interest or, uh, or collaborators uh, interest. Okay, so this study contribute, I mean, constitutes a significant proportion of models in biomodel database. Coming to the main results, which you all are expecting to know so far. So what we found is that uh, in our study, about half the models cannot be reproduced using the information provided in the manuscript, uh, which is a shame because we would expect a mathematical model to be reproducible because of the end, these are uh, simple equations and equations should reproduce. Uh, uh, and of course, we know that reproducibility an issue in science and experiment. In, in experiment, you can uh, uh, expect lots of things to go wrong. But when it comes to mathematical equation, things shouldn't go wrong and they should reproduce exactly the way they are written. Uh, and then the figure should be uh, reproducible. But unfortunately, we couldn't uh, reproduce. Uh, this is also about half of the models we try to analyze. So 51% of the model rep reproducible and 49% could not be reproduced. Uh, based on the information provided in the manuscript, supplementary material, and so on. So then, as, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we try to dig further deep into it, into the model. We try to empirically fix the model, as mentioned earlier. We try to tweak the parameter value. Sometimes it can be a mistake, a typo. Uh, author could have typed 0.01 instead of 0.001. We try to fix those errors. Could be an equation error. Mistake in the equation could be a plus instead of minus, and so on. So we try to fix those errors. Uh, and try to see if we can get the model working. By doing this empirical correction, we sometimes uh, get the model working and 9% uh, of the model worked uh, through such approach. And then uh, we also contacted the authors and about 3% of the models uh, were reproduced uh, with the help uh, from the authors. Okay, one important thing which we want to share here today is that uh, uh, when we try to contact the authors, uh, uh, we tried to contact about 90 authors and majority of them did not respond. 70% of them did not respond to our request and only 30% of them did respond. Even in those who did respond, we could uh, reproduce only uh, roughly half of their models because sometimes they respond saying that, oh, the PhD student who did this work left ages ago, uh, I moved to a different institution, we don't have the data anymore and so on and so forth. So really don't have uh, uh, useful information from the author, even if they respond that we can reproduce the model. But what is uh, as a shame is that about 70% uh, of the authors do not respond to our request. And when we try to look at the reproducibility of the models and the 
compare them across the age of the publication. And you are, what you can see here is that the proportion of the reproducible and non-reproducible models uh, is fairly the same across across all the age groups. Uh, that's not much change. But what you can notice is that you get more response from the models uh, that were recently uh, recently published. So, uh, so the authors are likely to respond for a new model, which is understood and understandable. Then we try to see if that is any different from the journal, the way they they do the peer review. And what we saw is that that isn't a pattern. Uh, some some journals, uh, I mean, have like equal proportion of good and bad. I mean, reproducible non reproducible model. And uh, uh, when you go do down further in this chart, you see some models. Some journals are having all reproducible models. Some are having all non 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 reproducible models. But we cannot come to a fair conclusion because we had very few models from these journals in the bottom. Uh, so, so there is no clear pattern. So, but uh, we we think that the the problem is in the peer review itself, which is common across all the journals. Okay, so we want to know what are the main reasons for which uh, we cannot reproduce a model. We went further deep uh, and asked uh, specific reasons, and what we found was that the three major reasons for which a model is not reproducible uh, are the following. We are ha having missing parameter values, or uh, we're having uh, missing initial condition, or we're having uh, inconsistency in the structure of the model that is a mistake in the, in the way equations are written and so on and so forth, or a combination of these three, uh, three factors. Often, what we found, what we encountered is that the, there is no reason, or that we couldn't find, figure out what's the reason uh, the model is not reproducible. The reason is clearly unknown in many, majority of the cases. Although we, we try to explore the model as much as we can, we cannot come up with a reason why this model is not reproducible. The model has got all the information it need. We need uh, we, the model has got miss, uh, all the parameter values, initial condition, the structure is all correct, but yet uh, something is wrong somewhere, obviously, and there's no easy way to figure that out. Uh, uh, so in a majority of the models, we cannot find a valid reason. So, okay, we did a study and where are these models? So all these models are in Biomodels database. And uh, we are uh, uh, having these curated, the produced model under the curated branch of the Biomodels. And we're having the non-reproducible models under the non-curated uh, uh, branch of the model model. So they are not yet curated. Uh, we will soon, uh, uh, they are not attacked that these are failed models, we will soon attack them and make it obvious that these models are reproduced and these models are those which we attempted to reproduce and then they didn't uh, reproduce. Okay, so we have this reproducible issue. How can we solve this problem? How can we fix this? So this is a, it's a, it's a concern. So we came up with a simple uh, scorecard that can be used by the be, by the editors or uh, uh, reviewers or even in the authors themselves to, to assess their model very quickly. So this reproducibility scorecard, I think we will discuss this in a bit more details and we will do some hands-on uh, using this uh, scorecard. So what you can, what we, we, we came with that, it's, it's not always possible to carefully check uh, during the peer review process. Of, often the models are not being properly checked. So we need to have something very simple. It's easy to do, quick, uh, by just uh, going to the model. And we came up with this eight questions based on our uh, or analysis of these uh, 455 models. So these are simple eight questions and you have yes or no answer to these questions. And by answering yes or no, you, you kind of score the model. A S answer gives a unit score to each model. So your model can have uh, up to eight max of eight scores, so you can have eight out of eight, or you can have zero out of eight. Uh, let me quickly go through some of these questions. Uh, maybe we can discuss this in a bit of details a bit later, but uh, just to give enough idea uh, what these questions are. Number one, uh, the question is uh, about are, are the mathematical expressions of this, the, the model described in the manuscript or the supplementary material? So this is very important to have a description so that even if the code is shared, you can figure out there's something wrong with the code if the, the expressions are described properly in the manuscript. Number two, are the parameter values and the entity initial concentrations are listed as stable, uh, preferably in the manuscript or supplementary material. So this is also very important because often the models 
fail to provide these information, which are very crucial to, to reproduce the simulation results. And without parameter values, it's really hard to, to, to reproduce uh, simulations. Number three, are the simulation conditions, including the changes in parameter values or concentrations, uh, data normalization provided? So this is important uh, in most cases where you have different conditions of simulation. So uh, an author can simulate various scenarios, uh, but may fail to provide information on what scenario were these, uh, these simulations made. And lack of such information will, uh, will stop us from reproducing the results. So number four, the question is, are the model codes uh, uh, shared publicly? That will be really a big plus to, to reproduce a model. Uh, without code, it's, some, it's very hard to always encode them. Uh, even if, it, if you have to code them in a different language, having a code in another uh, language would help us to, to look back and see if that's, that's, uh, everything is correctly encoded uh, or fix things if there's, uh, there's a mistake. Uh, point number five is, uh, are the model codes uh, available in standard formats such as SBML? Of course, that would be really great to have models uh, in SBML combined archive. This is because it will include the reproducibility. And having a model code publicly available, also having the model code in uh, standard format will be advantageous because uh, you will be able to import the models in any of the modeling tools and run simulation and reproduce the, uh, in fact, reproduce the results quickly. Uh, you can try this uh, in various tools and so on and so forth. And number six, are the model codes uh, uh, code posted in a relevant open model database, such as uh, Biomodels or Physiome or GWS Online? This, this is again a plus because then these uh, the databases provide extra, uh, extra curation services, which will help uh, to improve the reproducibility of the model. The sound point is to, to assess, uh, is to assess the, the uh, annotation within the model. Of course, if it is a code, then you need to have proper documentation of the code. And, or you may uh, want to uh, annotate a SVML model using control vocabulary such as gene ontologies, uh, KB, uh, and uh, disease ontology, and so on, which also uh, will make the model uh, highly uh, findable with various layers of information. Okay, the last point, uh, the most important point is, are the numerical results shared? If the numerical results of the simulation are not shared, it's very hard to, to, to tell if the model is reproducible, otherwise it's usually going to be fit by eye. Uh, but having the uh, results, numerical results shared would be an advantage because then we will be able to compare the results uh, uh, and then decide how reproducible the simulations are not. So these are the eight questions. Okay, now we propose these, and then of course the, the general, uh, the uh, editors ask, are, how can you prove that your scorecard is working? And yes, of course, we did a bit of analysis again to show that uh, on the top, what you see is the distribution of this total score across various uh, models we analyzed. And in the bottom, what you can see here is, the, is that as the total score or uh, of the reproductive scorecard increases, uh, the percentage of reproducible model also increases. So higher the score, more reproducible the models are. Of course, that a model could be quite could could have a very high score and could not be reproducible. Also, but in, in overall, the chance of model to be more reproducible increases with the increase in the total reproducibility score. And of course, we did a little bit of statistics to show that uh, uh, show that uh, by randomly choosing 110 models, if the score is above four, the the chances the 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 there's a significant chance that the model is going to be reproducible with an odds ratio of uh, of uh, 4.62. So so the conclusion or the bottom line is that if if, if we use a reproducibility scorecard uh, and we assess the model, if the score is uh, more than four, the model is highly likely to be reproducible. Although you did not assess the reproducibility by encoding the model, these simple questions are very good indicators uh, whether and they, they, they convey whether the model is reproducible uh, based with, as, uh, as a function of the score, total score we get here. So that's why we recommend that these, this scorecard can be used by the editors, uh, reviewers, uh, or the model authors themselves uh, during the peer review process because it's very quick and simple to use and give, give, will give you a quick idea whether the models, uh, models uh, are going to be reproducible or not. 
So this, of course, publication uh, work was out a while ago. And, uh, and, of, and when we shared this publicly, we had several impressed from the community, lots of shares and tweets among the best tweets of biomodels. Uh, as you can see, about 100 likes and lots of shares. And uh, in the later session, uh, we can have a bit more hands-on on this. Uh, so we have a version of the scorecard to download, which is a Word, Word document from the, the general link below. We can download this and try to uh, do the assess uh, some of these models, uh, manuscripts, more, uh, and see the, the score and compare and see if the models were reproducible or not uh, later stage. Uh, with this, I would like to end this discussion and uh, acknowledge everyone. Of course, it's a work that's uh, done by contributed by lots of curators and bio models and uh, thank you for listening and i'm happy to take any further uh, questions discuss here can you hear yeah. me uh, yes. hi my name is uber winkemeyer i'm uh, not really a modeler i'm using them and in collaboration uh, so um what i was uh, wondering that so few authors responded uh, is there any explanation that sounds didn't they get your requests or or did they simply not bother uh this i i do not know but uh the real intention but we try to reach out uh, whenever we could find an email to contact the author and uh, these are the cases where we didn't hear a uh, bounce back email so these are mm -hmm. authors where the email went through so we do not know we cannot be sure why i didn't respond mm -hmm. at least uh, uh so but uh, we had few responses uh, where even in those cases, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they respond that, oh, the person uh, is, uh, has left the lab or mm -hmm. gone to a different organization and so on. And even in cases where we had, in one case, we had a response, I mean, of course, that was not part of the study in a different uh, uh, context. Uh, the author, in, the, in fact, had, had passed away but uh, someone from the family were able to dig out the files from the computer and then send it to us and we were able to curate the model. So there are good cases as well. Yeah, that's good to you. Yeah. I think one of the problems in this context is that it's just not relevant. So in the publication process, it's relevant to get your publication out Mm -hmm. But any other scholarly output, as we all know, is still uh, valued very poorly. And so people just move on to get, okay, I've got my publication. The rest is not relevant anymore. And that's why part of what we are doing at the EBI, I think what also in general the community is getting much more aware of, is to value scientific output beyond the publication and to value also things like public data sets, curated models, contributions to ontology development, and that all of these things are also valued where it really counts in um, selection committees, tenure committees, etc. Mm -hmm. But obviously that is a very slow process. Yeah, I agree. So there should be more, more than just uh, uh, getting the model out so as Henning said we should look into other factors how many times a model is being downloaded or reused so we we, we provide a row set uh, in the bio models that tells you if a model is being reused or uh, uh, if it's being how many times it's being downloaded so one can use this information and a, a reproducible model of course the the chance to to reuse is high and what we have, saw, we have seen is that uh, we, uh, we don't have, we haven't done the uh, statistics properly, but uh, we have information we will do at some point properly, but uh, a mo model that's curated, that is reproducible and curated uh, is downloaded twice more than the one which is not curated and reproduced. So there is a higher chance for a model to be uh, 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 downloaded and have a huge impact, I mean, higher impact uh, when the model results are reproducible. And this information can, of course, be used during the, the tenure decisions and uh, grants and so on. Yeah. Okay, so there was this, this discussion from Ruth, uh, 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 who said, uh, I will just read out the question. Hi, I work at F1000, an open science academic publisher. 
Do you plan to make this core card available for publisher to use as a part of the review process? How do you envision this being used? Yes, of course, the answer is yes. That's why we organized this meeting and uh, the scorecard is publicly available. Uh, uh, and you can reuse it. Uh, so the, uh, in the next part of the session, we will show how this can be reused. Uh, it's a simple word document where you have yes or no answers. So you just say yes, no, check, check boxes. And, uh, and the total score uh, will be used uh, uh, weight as a way to assess the model. So what we recommend is that the, the score is uh, at least four or more. So if you are uh, reviewing an article and then, the, and, and then the score is less than four, then we suggest that you provide the scorecard to the, uh, to the model author until that uh, these are the points you need to make sure uh, you fulfill so that the score increases. So that's very simple. And as we have shown, higher the score, higher chance the model is going to be, uh, uh, to be reproducible. So, so it should be straightforward and easy to use. And this, this is something which we will do in the, in the next part of the session. Okay, do you, so Gil has another question. Do you consider bifurcation diagram as well as simulation? Yes, yes, yes. So, uh, I mean, of course we consider bifurcation diagram also as, a, uh, as one of the figures should be used, but uh, often what we don't do is, uh, we don't reproduce all the figures. If there are, uh, if there's only one figure and that's my figuration diagram, then of course, uh, for sure, we would have to reproduce that uh, to, to reproduce the model. Uh, it could be possible that there could be five figures in the in the manuscript and then one of them is my figuration graph and uh, we would just reproduce one of the figure. That's the first figure uh, or a second figure. Uh, and then uh, if that is reproducible, then we call them all as reproducible. Of course, that is the caveat. We don't look at all the figures, but then we have to balance between the the the, the resource we use. If you have to reproduce all the figures, then we'll be spending lots of resource on one model. Uh, so so we go with the assumption that if we manage to reproduce one model uh, one model figure using the code, then hopefully the other figure should also be reproducible, and that's where we make the trade off. Okay, um, uh, and there's this question uh, that question, questions four and six in this scorecard uh, seem uh, partly redundant. Do you find many papers that score differently on these two points? Uh, uh, yes, we, oh, how do I go back here? Yeah, okay. So what we're trying to do here is from four to six, uh, we want the model to be public. We want the model to be in a standard format. We want the model to be an open database. So, so if you have a model uh, in, in, in all these three, I mean, fulfill all these three, then, uh, then we can, you can increase the chance of it to be reproducible because you have extra, have to put extra effort to, to do all these. And, and sometimes you can have a model in SBML and that's not being shared publicly, there are cases. And uh, you have, I think you will, you will have in many cases four where a model will be shared publicly. Uh, models will be shared publicly in either GitHub repository or personal website or supplementary. And the, the models will not be in standard format. The models will not be uh, in an open database. So there are cases where things, uh, the manuscript will score differently for this. Uh, and most often four means the model is shared uh, publicly but not in a, in a standard format, uh, which will make the models highly interoperable and easy to re, uh, reuse. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, often they're not in open databases as well. Probably one more word on this. The idea is also to have it really as easy as possible. And with the simple flat list of eight questions, even if number six implies number four, it's the easiest to just say each of these has one point, uh, one point as a score for the for a positive answer, and you just add up up to eight times one, rather than having more complicated branching questions or whatever. So it's really because we've worked with authors and uh, journals before, and the idea was to have it really as simple as possible to support easy implementation.
Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Although there is this uh, uh, nested question at the end, uh, as Henning mentioned, we wanted to keep really simple. If you if you make something very complex, often uh, this will not be adapted and it can uh, uh, not be used. So we wanted to to keep this way, uh, so that it's easy to to reuse reuse this. So I think we all have had like a bit of experience in using a scorecard. Uh, so uh, so it's not too difficult, I hope, to use, and uh, it's very a uh, little easier and uh, it just. Uh, uh, can be easily used during the review process uh, to assess whether the model is going to be reproducible or not. And we recommend using it in the review process, of course. So, uh, thanks to UKRN for allowing us to host this, um, in, I mean, organize this meeting so that we can reach out to you and, uh, and please uh, feel free to use it during the peer review process when someone comes to review, uh, more, uh, to re review a manuscript, then you can use this and share this with the editors and hopefully they will uh, uh, find it useful and can also use uh, in other other manuscripts uh, where they review. Feel free to share this with your friends, and uh, we are here to have uh, help if there is any question. And uh, yeah, and I think uh, thanks for joining the session today. I think this is a very important uh, task. We all have to work together to improve the reproducibility in the scientific community, and specifically mm -hmm. uh, modeling if we are in that field. Uh, and every 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 uh, uh, field is taking their own uh, steps or initiative to improve reproducibility, and so are we uh, as a community uh, in systems working on systems biology modeling. And I uh, hope uh, we can work together to improve the reproducibility of the models. Yeah, I I think to establish some parameters to. Um to measure reproducibility, not just in modeling, uh, would be really uh, helpful and important because there's so much things being published and then, yeah, nobody knows if it's true. Uh, and that is something that uh, should be really valued. Yes. I think it's becoming you. a bit more popular. Um, I work with some people in nutrition, some people in biochemistry, some people in analytical chemistry. And I'm seeing a few efforts to try to, you know, not only get the modeling step to be more reproducible, but even the data that goes into the model yeah. have these, uh, you know, parameters which can be shared between, um, you know, machines more easily. Try to, you know, have ring trials be more efficient as well. I, I think it's, uh, I think it's becoming more and more acknowledged that how important this is. To be honest, it's quite mm, yes. nice to see. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so any other comments from other other listeners? No. All right, then uh, thank you very much for joining uh, everyone. It was nice meeting you all. Uh, Thanks okay. very much. Thank you. It was great. Thank you.